talk to you a little bit today about Andrew Jackson. I've been spending a lot of time with Jackson, uh, having curated uh, an exhibition that is now open at the Historic Moments Collection. And uh, Jackson is an intrinsically interesting person. Uh, as the hero of New Orleans, he was certainly among the most famous and influential men in our country's early history, uh, as well as one of its most polarizing figures. And not everyone is interested in, in Andrew Jackson, but he seems to provoke strong reactions in people even today. I was in receipt of an email late last night from someone who uh, uh, referred to him as an arrogant, uh, I won't say the word, but it rhymes with casserole. Historians and biographers have really struggled to depict Andrew Jackson as he was, um, veering from hagiography to hatchet job over the past couple of hundred years. Um, the first serious scholar to study Jackson was James Parton in the 1850s, and he fairly eloquently sums up the diversity of opinion on Jackson, and I'll quote him. Andrew Jackson, I am given to understand, was a patriot and a traitor. He was one of the greatest generals and wholly ignorant of the art of war. A writer brilliant, elegant, eloquent, without being able to compose a correct sentence or spell words of four syllables. <laughs> the first of statesmen, he never devised, he never framed a measure. He was the most candid of men and was capable of the profoundest dissimulation. A most law-defying, law-abiding citizen, a stickler for discipline, he never hesitated to disobey a superior. A democratic autocrat, an urbane savage, an atrocious saint. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this atrocious saint. Little in Jackson's boyhood in the Carolinas would have indicated he was destined for greatness. He was born in 1767 to landless North, Northern Irish immigrants and orphaned by the ravages of, of the Revolutionary War. Uh, Ron mentioned an incident. Um, of course, he, he lost his two older brothers and his mother, and Ron already mentioned an incident where he was chastised, shall we say, by a British cavalry officer for Jackson's refusal to polish the man's boots. Um, he, even as a boy, he was someone who did not back down. I always thought this was an apocryphal story, but uh, the, the historical consensus seems to be that it did actually happen. And in fact, years later, a friend of Jackson's claimed that he could lay his finger in the dent in Jackson's skull that the officer's saber had left. Another childhood friend of Jackson described how skinny little Andrew would wrestle and get thrown down three times out of four, but he never would stay throwed, the friend recalled. He was dead game even then, never would give up. Though he was impatient with schoolrooms, Andrew applied himself to the study of law before saddling up and heading west to seek his fortune as hundreds of others like him were doing. And Jarrett Rutherford, who met Jackson as a young man in the 1780s, had this recollection of him. In feature, he was by no means good looking, she wrote. His face was long and narrow, his features sharp and angular, and his complexion yellow and freckled. But his eyes were handsome. They were very large, a kind of steel blue, and when he talked to you, he always looked straight into your eyes. And she went in on to recall that, quote, when he was calm, he talked slowly and with very good selected language. But if animated by anything, then he would talk fast and with a very marked North Irish brogue. Jackson worked as a lawyer and circuit judge in the territory that would become the state of Tennessee, riding countless miles by himself through the wilderness. He spent much of his life in the saddle, it seems, and he, through his life, prided himself on his horsemanship. Eventually, um, through his work as a judge and, and attorney, he attracted the attention and support of the powerful governor of what would become Tennessee, Willie, Willie Blunt, uh, and he entered the political arena. He was on Tennessee's Constitutional Convention. He was one of its first elected representatives in the Congress, uh, and he even served briefly in the Senate uh, in the, in the late 1790s, um, but he wasn't temperamentally suited for legislative work. And in any case, he didn't find real acclaim until later in life, uh, after he transitioned to a career as a militia general. Jackson was elected to command the Tennessee militia in February of 1802, 
But a decade passed before he was called upon to fight. When the War of 1812 broke out, he readied his men for service. Later, on August 30th, 1813, the attack on Fort Mims, again, Ron already mentioned this, um, it escalated an open war between elements of the Creek Nation uh, called Red Sticks uh, and the United States. And when the news of the Fort Mims massacre reached Nashville, Jackson was uh, convalescing, again, from a gunshot wound that he had suffered in a, a brawl in a, a Nashville hotel with the Benton brothers. Um, Legislator Enoch Parsons expression of regret that Tennessee's general would be unable to join his mobilized troops in the field. And Jackson is said to have responded, the devil in hell he's not. So as his men mustered for duty, Jackson was there in the saddle to lead them, his honor is slain. And over the next several months, he carried the fight into the heart of Creek territory. He lacked formal training as a military officer. He and his uh, officers got a lot of their information on the evolution of you know, troop movements, how to move from column into line, all that out of manuals, instruction manuals. Um, and then the rudiments of, of military campaigning. Jackson, as a, a commanding general, also had to figure out the administrative aspects of command. And this is an interesting document from our collection. Um, it's a general order from early 1813 that provides evidence of Jackson's unfamiliarity with how orders are promulgated throughout his command. Usually, uh, it's an aide de camp or an adjutant general that forwards those through the rank and file. And here, Jackson has scratched out his own signature on this, on this order and has written in the name of his aide de camp, Andrew Hines. But that's all completely in Andrew Jackson's own hand. He's just figuring out the bureaucracy of command here. Eventually, he works out how to be an effective general, how to administer an army in the field. After victories at Tallahassee and Talladega, Jackson struggled in the winter months of 1814 to overcome logistical hurdles such as expiring militia enlistments, dwindling supplies, um, until reinforcements enabled him to renew the campaign. The decisive battle against the Red Stick Creeks was fought at Topeka, known as the Horseshoe Bend in what's now uh, central Alabama. Uh, and there, an estimated 1,000 warriors held a fortified position, uh, but Jackson's superior numbers and firepower encircled and eventually overwhelmed the Creek, thus effectively ending the Creek War. Ron mentioned uh, Jackson's adoption of a young Creek boy um, that actually happened after the Battle of Tawasachi. Uh, this is Lynn Koya. Um, some biographers of Jackson claimed that his conduct of the Creek War, which was brutal, I mean, he was waging essentially a campaign of extermination against these hostile Creeks. Uh, and they look at his subsequent policies as president to um, argue that he had a, a deep-seated just hatred of, of Indians. And it's certainly true that Jackson saw the presence of sovereign Indian nations within the territory of the United States as being inherently problematic from a security standpoint. He had come of age on the frontier, and he had seen how the Native American nations had been used as proxies uh, to fight and, and to basically carry out the ambitions of Europe's colonial powers. And he felt that as long as there were intact sovereign Indian nations within the United States, that would always be a, a, a security threat for, for the nation. But anyway, um, just to problematize our, our concept of Jackson's opinion about Indians on a personal level, um, it's a bit more complicated. This is a letter that recently came to light. It's not anywhere uh, included in the um, inventory of Jackson's papers, but it's something that um, we very recently found. Um, it's a letter from Jackson to his wife, Rachel. He's on his way to Fort Jackson to negotiate the treaty with the surviving Creeks. And he specifically mentions Lincoya, who's the young Creek boy that he had adopted and had sent to the Hermitage. And about Lincoya, he writes to his wife, take good care of little Lincoya. The manner in which Providence threw him on my care has inspired me with feelings relative to this child of nature that induces me to endeavor to have him preserved and raised. Something about Lincoln struck a particular, uh, you know, 
really struck Jackson, who of course himself was an orphan. Um, but this is an example of one of those kinds of documents that just complicates our, our notion of a historical figure. Um, and actually, the boy was one of, of, of three uh, Indian children that Jackson adopted. One died very quickly, but there was another uh, young Indian boy as well that were raised uh, at the Hermitage. Well, newspaper accounts kept the public informed of Jackson's Creek War campaign. The Madison administration seized the opportunity to promote Jackson from the Tennessee Territorial Militia into the regular uh, Army Infantry of the United States. Um, the War of 1812, of course, at this point is not going so well. There have been some notable fiascos involving, of course, General Hull uh, by Detroit and General Winder would uh, make a cock of it at Bladensburg. Um, Jackson is given a, a commission as a brigadier general and then very quickly a, a major general seat. And he's placed in command of the 7th Military District, uh, which encompassed Tennessee, the Mississippi Territory, and Louisiana, which of course included the vital port of New Orleans, uh, by far the United States' most valuable Western possession. But one of Jackson's first responsibilities as the commander of that district was to negotiate the treaty with the surviving Creeks at Fort Jackson, which occupied the, the old uh, Fort Toulouse, a little north of uh, Mobile. And there Jackson demanded and received the cession of, of just about well, a little more than half of the Creeks' ancestral lands, about three-fifths of what would become the state of Alabama. And this was a very hard and cruel treaty in, in many ways because, of course, not all of the Creeks were hostile. Some of them were Jackson's allies and had fought at his side, but he basically uh, imposed this very hard bargain on all of them. And by this time, Jackson's Indians, friends, and foes had begun to refer to him uh, by a new nickname, a sharp knife. And with the Treaty of Fort Jackson, he had slashed an opening for American expansion all the way to Spanish Florida, where British officers were rumored to be plotting a new offensive on the side of the coast. And Jackson, of course, was determined to deny his old enemies, the British, any foothold on the Gulf Coast. Um, we've already heard discussion about Jackson's invasion of Pensacola in October, uh, I'm sorry, early November of 1814. It was the capital of Spanish West Florida. He had heard uh, correctly, it turned out, that British troops were using the forts of Pensacola. Uh, he knew he had to deny them uh, a, a port on the Gulf Coast. So he took action. Um, and then very soon after that, when, when he's at Mobile, he receives very good intelligence that the actual attack is destined for New Orleans. So he leaves uh, in about mid-November and passes overland to Louisiana where he reaches New Orleans around December 1st. And here is where I was going to give my, my capsule summary of the Battle of New Orleans, but I don't think I can improve on what Ron has already told you. Um, I will just mention that a friend of mine earlier today sent me uh, a link to an article that apparently, I, I guess it's in the current issue of The New Yorker, uh, written by uh, James McWilliams. I don't know Mr. McWilliams. But, um, McWilliams presents Jackson's victory at New Orleans as being almost an accident, that Jackson kind of blunders into this incredible victory by luck. Uh, at one point he writes something like, Jackson marshaled his troops to the edge of some ramparts and they peer over and they see all of these troops trying to cross a canal as if the ramparts were there and they just found them and these troops just happened to be on the other side. I was kind of wondering if Mr. McWilliams has ever actually conducted research on the Battle of New Orleans, but apparently not. Um, we know that it was a significant victory. We know that it accrued in no small measure, yes, to some critical British heirs, but also to some very able generalship on the part of Andrew Jackson. And of course, the Battle of New Orleans was then and is now one of the greatest military upsets in history. Um, what's been remarkable to me, what I've found remarkable, was the galvanizing effect that Jackson had on the very diverse population of New Orleans. New Orleans was a cosmopolitan city of about 20,000 people, almost evenly split between black and white residents. There was a lot of political infighting among the different various factions, uh, particularly among white Louisianans. You had uh, Francophone Creoles uh, who 
vied for um, political prestige and control against newly arrived Americans. Um, for months, these, these various factions had, had dithered over security issues, and they accomplished almost nothing. Um, Jackson's predecessor, General Thomas Flournoy, had been unable to mobilize the, the local militia the previous spring when there was a rumor of a British attack on the Louisiana coast. Um, Governor Claiborne was an object of open ridicule on the part of many local Creoles and foreign Frenchmen who looked at him as a bit of an ass, really, kind of an alarmist. Um, but then Jackson arrives, and within days, um, he, he kind of turns all of that around. He, he cuts through all of that paralysis and indecision, and he unites these factions. And yes, danger is on the doorstep. They know that the British are actually very near, and it's on, and it's happening, and that certainly helped. But I think it also required a man of Jackson's very uh, no-nonsense uh, personality, his, his refusal, essentially, to take no for an answer. Jackson had to successfully make the case that New Orleans could be saved under the flag of the United States, and that would not have been a sure argument to such a diverse population, um, especially coming the summer after Washington had been burned, all of our public buildings in Washington, it would not have inspired a great deal of confidence in the military prowess of the forces of the United States. The effect that Jackson had in, in, in reality can be seen not only in the sheer number of people who are volunteering to serve under him in December of 1814, but also in private letters that were published in newspapers all over the country in, in the months immediately following the battle. In a letter dated December 16, 1814, and published in the Connecticut Gazette the following January, one writer observed that, quote, we are at last roused from our security and criminal inaction. This gloomy aspect of our affairs is much relieved by the presence of a commander who unites with past successes in the fatigable exertion and activity, who I believe is confident in skill, and who inspires the affected with confidence and the disaffected with fear. All of the citizens are arming with alacrity. Another writer on December 19th observed, quote, at no moment of the present war in any part of the United States can there be adduced an example of greater alacrity, zeal, and unanimity in defense of their homes, their country, and their liberties that has been exhibited within the last week in New Orleans by its citizens when aware of the proximity of the enemy and when applied to in a proper manner and by a proper person, end quote. And that person, of course, was Andrew Jackson. Now, here was this scarecrow of a man, 62, 145 pounds, soaking wet, maybe a bit ragged around the edges from being months in the saddle. But there was something about him and his bearing and confidence that definitely did inspire people. So what was Jackson like as a public speaker? Newspaper editor Francis Blair would years later describe Jackson's uh, public speaking style, and perhaps it shed some light on how he might have addressed the people of New Orleans. Uh, this is what he said. He did not orate. He had none of the arts of oratory, so-called. His voice, though strong and penetrated, was untrained. About the only gestures he knew were the raising of both hands above his head to indicate reverence or veneration, the spreading of both arms wide out to indicate deprecation, and the fierce pointing of his long, gaunt forefinger straight forward like a pistol to indicate decision, dogmatism, or defiance. And candor compels me to say that he used that forefinger more than any other limb or member of the situation. Jackson didn't speak French. He needed his friend Edward Livingston to translate his words. But whatever words and gestures he used, the, the message clearly got through. And he appears to have understood crowd psychology in an instinctive way. Once the smoke had cleared after removing every attack by the British below the city, Jackson made sure to go along his line and tell his men and pump them up and say, yes, you are beating the best army in the world. And they were. This was the army that had beaten Bonaparte. And it worked, and those troops on the east bank stood their ground even during the grand assault of January 8th. On the west bank, not so much, uh, but then he wasn't there to encourage them. 
In addition to having managed troops, having to manage troops in the field, um, Jackson had to manage local politics. This he accomplished in part through his de declaration of martial law on December 16, 1814. Um, <clears throat> He strongly suggested that the state legislature remove itself to Baton Rouge for safety. Um, they didn't go, of course. Um, ostensibly, it was for their safety, but really it was because Jackson suspected um, that a faction of them wanted to make peace with the British invaders in order to spare their city. Later in December, his headquarters uh, were visited by three legislators, including uh, Folwar Skipwith, who was the Speaker of the Louisiana Senate. Uh, who wanted to know the general's plans for the city should he be defeated by the British below New Orleans. And Jackson replied to his adjutant general, uh, Robert Butler, with these words, If I thought the hair of my head knew my thoughts upon that subject, I would cut it off and burn it. <laughs> when they expressed dissatisfaction, the general elaborated, If I am so unfortunate as to be beaten from the lines I now occupy, and am compelled to retreat through New Orleans, you will have a warm session. <laughs> By which he meant that he would burn the city to the ground rather than let British troops have it. And whether this was a veiled threat to keep skittish politicians in line or something he would actually have done, we can only speculate. But the Louisiana legislature as a body did not question Jackson's conduct of the defense from that point on, though they did make a point of entirely omitting Jackson's name from their resolution of thanks to the troops and their officers the following January. They knew how to nurse a grudge. One aspect of Jackson's tenure in New Orleans that is left out of many histories, and I think many of you are, are aware of it, um, was his exceed, exceedingly poor health at the time. Not only had he managed to pick up a case of dysentery on the Overland March from Mobile, but the gunshot wounds he'd suffered in Nashville would become periodically inflamed, he'd suffer fever and loss of appetite, um, and that would recur periodically. Um, and he was basically subsisting on whiskey and water and very little food. And in this original letter dated January 3rd, just a few days before the final battle, he writes, Permit me again to suggest to you the propriety of turning your attention in time to some proper officer to take command of the army here, when my want of health, which I find to be greatly impaired, shall oblige me to retire from it. And of course, there were no other officers who could be sent, and Jackson retained his command for the duration of the crisis. Uh, this is an original letter in Jackson's own hand that is on display uh, at the historic New Orleans election. Jackson's use of martial law is another relatively little known aspect of the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, his arrival in New Orleans had been preceded by weeks of urgent correspondence uh, from Governor Claiborne uh, concerning the loyalty of Louisianans to the, to the United States and just the general disaffection. After Jackson read the proclamation to natives of Louisiana from uh, Brevet Lieutenant Colonel Edward Nichols, who was a Royal Marine uh, in West Florida, uh, and also seeing firsthand uh, the panic and disorder preceding the British landing and following the news of the results of the Battle of Lake Bourne, um, Jackson declares martial law on December 16, 1814 basically suspending the uh, free movement of its citizens and turning New Orleans into an armed encampment uh, subject to his military authority. There weren't really any real complaints about it at the time. Of course, danger was on the doorstep. It was very urgent and real. Um, but soon after the decisive defeat of the British Army at Chalmette and the subsequent departure of its surviving troops later in January, locals began to implore Jackson to heed reports of the peace treaty that had been signed, allegedly, uh, and to lift the military curfews and restrictions that had become a hardship. Jackson would not do so while the British Army remained uh, encamped on Dauphin Island as the day sail away, I think a very sensitive precaution on his part. When a newspaper editorial criticized Jackson's heavy-handedness with uh, some of the local French citizens in New Orleans, some of them had applied to the French consul and received exemptions from duty. Jackson said, okay, as long as you completely leave my jurisdiction and, and uh, come no nearer than Baton Rouge until the, the crisis is over. Well, Jackson had the writer of that editorial, Louis Lallier, who was in the Louisiana legislature, had him arrested and thrown in jail. 
And then when a, a local federal judge attempted to intervene on Ruadier's behalf, Jackson had that judge arrested and escorted to the city limits again until the crisis would end. Well, official news of the war's end uh, reaches Jackson's headquarters in mid-March, actually on March 13, 1815, uh, and he immediately lifted martial law. Within days, he received a summons from the judge he had arrested. This is Dominic A. Hall of the District Court of Louisiana. Hall summoned Jackson to his court to ask him why he felt uh, constrained, why he felt empowered to interfere with the independent judiciary of the United States in Louisiana. And Jackson appeared in his court. He was ultimately fined $1,000 by Judge Hall, and he paid it. But he also obtained statements from his fellow officers uh, supporting his decision to declare martial law due to the unique nature of the emergency. This is a, a painting showing that very famous uh, appearance. Um, and I think it's telling that Jackson appears in civilian dress, uh, as he actually did, in fact. Um, you know, in ancient Rome, when there was a crisis, the, the Romans would elect a dictator to take total power and just make the problem go away. Jackson had improvised more or less a dictatorship for himself using the Declaration of Martial Law. And his appearance in Judge Hall's court in civilian dress was very symbolic. It was reminiscent of Cincinnatus of ancient Rome having, after the crisis passed, laid down his, his absolute power to return to his humble life uh, on the farm. Jackson made the same gesture uh, in Judge Hall's court. An entire uh, section of the exhibition that we have deals with this uh, very famous case. Um, Jackson, by the way, never apologized for his use of martial law during the crisis, stating that he would, quote, under similar circumstances, not refrain from a course equally bold. So I briefly mentioned Jackson's management of troops, but one of his tactics at New Orleans well, Jackson's decision, I think, as Ron already mentioned, to uh, immediately attack the British uh, on the evening of January, or, I'm sorry, December 23, 1814, was a, a critical decision. It's, he showed no hesitation. He took the fight directly to the British, and he took them by surprise. Um, and in doing so, he knocked the invaders off schedule, made them hesitate, bought himself and his troops valuable time to fall back and establish a strong defensive position on the river. And then later, he very wisely keeps his men in that defensive posture for the duration of the crisis, even when they are applying to him uh, to be given permission. Uh, I think Heinz Cavalry was one that wanted to chase the uh, defeated British troops back to their encampment, and Jackson said no. He kept them very wisely behind his strong uh, defensive works. And that just shows patience and, and tactical understanding on Jackson's part. He understood the limitations of his men, untrained militia and volunteers that could not contend in open field warfare with veteran British troops who were very skilled in the use of the bayonet after years of fighting uh, in the peninsula and other places. Jackson is uh, often dismissed as a, a rash and impulsive military officer. Um, there, you know, there were many bad American generals in the War of 1812. You, I mentioned General Hall, General Wilkinson in Canada, uh, General Winter in the Chesapeake. Jackson was not one of them. In his actual uh, tactical maneuvering uh, and operations, he showed a good deal of judgment. Which isn't to say that he never made mistakes uh, or that he was always right, but he was not afraid to make decisions that were unpopular, uh, but in his view necessary, and he was fiercely loyal to his country and to the troops under his command. His personal bravery was and is beyond dispute, for he shared every danger with his troops. And these qualities, in addition to his eye for detail, his logistical acumen, and the sheer force of personality, allowed him to succeed where many lesser men would probably have failed. I'm personally convinced that no other American general could have def defended New Orleans as ably as Jackson did in late 1814. <clears throat> this was a huge crisis for America's most important and culturally diverse Western possession, uh, and it needed someone with Jackson's toughness, ability, and personal charisma, as well as the iron will to see it through to the end. 
In the weeks following the battle, people in cities throughout the United States daily expected news that New Orleans, the country's most important western port, had fallen to the enemy. Uh, and there's actually uh, at least one newspaper report that I've seen that reports the fall of New Orleans as if it actually happened. Few people believed that the small American force there could prevail against the British army that had sacked our capital the, the summer before. So when reports of a lopsided American victory began to spread up the Atlantic seaboard, people just could not believe it. Um, people cheered. It was like the Saints winning the Super Bowl times a thousand. <laughs> Bells were ringing, people dancing in the streets. Everyone wanted to see and know more about the victorious American general from Tennessee. This is a very early print uh, from Francisco Scappi, printed in Philadelphia, uh, sometime between 1815 and 1817. And it's probably the very first portrait of Jackson that becomes available to the public. All it is is just a generic uh, general officer. It's Scappi and obviously never been to Louisiana. You can see that he has the Mississippi River on the wrong side of the battlefield. For <laughs> Well, these are the very first portraits of Andrew Jackson ever painted. And they are on display right now at the historic New Orleans collection. The one on the left, the Jean-Francois Vallier, is a, is a tiny miniature. It's in the collections of historic Hudson Valley. Uh, it was given as a gift from Jackson to his good friend Edward Livingston, and it's been uh, in upstate New York ever since where the Livingstons were from. Um, the other was done by Nathan W. Wheeler, uh, originally from Massachusetts, uh, who apparently served under Jackson at New Orleans. Um, but they were done both at the same time, probably in February or March of 1815, immediately after the Battle of New Orleans. Um, you can see that the Wheeler portrait, Jackson looks very thin and emaciated. His, his eyes are sunk. Uh, his nose is very prominent. Um, he looks just unhealthy, doesn't he? But anyway, these two portraits, they look nothing alike, but they are the first glimpses that, that the public by and large get of Andrew Jackson in America. They're reproduced in various places. Um, our Senator Carrier Latour wrote the first history of the Battle of New Orleans, published in Philadelphia in 1816. He copies Vallier's portrait of Jackson as the frontispiece from his book. This is what it looked like. <coughs> Latour was an engineer, not an artist. <laughs> the first published biography of Jackson in 1817, written by his uh, aide-de-camp John Reed and his friend John Henry Eaton of Tennessee, who became his Secretary of War when he was president, um, copies the other portrait by Wheeler as the frontispiece of that book. And again, it's not very flattering, but at least it looks like the painting. But anyway, this is the first sense of Andrew Jackson's actual appearance that people across the country get through these various uh, permutations. It's not really until 1819 that Jackson can sit for port accomplished portrait painters. Uh, it's after the first Seminole War when he goes to defend his conduct of that war in Washington and then ends up making a tour of East Coast cities. He, in 1819, he goes up to New York, sits for Samuel Lovett Waldo, um, John Vanderlyn and other accomplished portrait painters who depict him as he actually appeared at the time. It's difficult to overstate the magnitude of Jackson's popularity through this time uh, in the early 19th century uh, in art and song, particularly in the southern and western states and territories. Depictions of Jackson's victory at New Orleans and of Jackson himself formed a significant part of, of a post-war 1812 surge in American patriotic imagery, particularly in the cultural production of the United States. Uh, you see frontier militiamen and their general become these sort of paragons of American masculinity and self-reliance. In 1821, a few years after the Seminole War, uh, Jackson resigns his commission as a major general and briefly serves as the governor of Florida, which he had just acquired from Spain. Um, Soon after his return to Tennessee, the legislature nominates him as a candidate for the 1824 presidential election. And some artistic representations of Jackson in this period mark his transition from military commander to civilian statesman, though he's still very much the hero of New Orleans. 
And I wanted to mention the 1824 race in Louisiana, uh, which was notable for the creative means used by Jackson's supporters to tilt the odds away from Henry Clay of Kentucky, Senator from Kentucky. Uh, Jackson and Clay were kind of neck and neck uh, in terms of political popularity in Louisiana at that time. Um, some Louisianans, though, were more inclined to vote for Clay because of Jackson's suspicions of them during the uh, invasion of New Orleans. So Jackson's supporters used strategically timed horse races and other diversions to distract and delay pro-Clay delegates from reaching the legislative session in New Orleans, where the state's electors would be chosen. Um, some of Several uh, pro-Clay legislators fell to temptation and failed to appear, thus splitting Louisiana's electoral votes between Jackson and John Quincy Adams. You can see here, John Jackson gets three votes, John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts two votes, so the vote is split between them. Um, that probably cost Henry Clay the presidency in 1824. Jackson went on to win the popular vote in the national election, uh, but without the necessary margin to take office. Aghast that Jackson might actually win, Henry Clay wrote a letter that was widely published in the newspapers at the time, expressing his disbelief that, quote, killing 2,500 Englishmen at New Orleans qualifies for the various difficult and complicated duties of the chief magistrate. Um, he was uh, still ticked off about those horse races. In the end, the U.S. House of Representatives awarded the presidency to John Quincy Adams, who chose Henry Clay as the Secretary of State, provoking cries of bargains and corruption among Jackson's supporters. The second contest between John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson in 1828 was one of the nastiest, most vituperative political races in American history. Um, confronted with the popularity of the hero of New Orleans, Adams supporters attempted to tarnish Jackson's military reputation by turning it against him. They criticized his declaration of martial law in New Orleans uh, and focused attention on another wartime incident concerning the court martial of six Tennessee militiamen in Mobile for mutiny in December of 1814. Jackson upheld their death sentence from New Orleans, uh, hoping that this severe example would prevent mass desertions and preserve the security of the region while, of course, the British Army is right there. Uh, and the executions were carried out on February 21st, 1815. Well, this incident is uh, sort of put out on public view in a series of what were called the Coffin Broadsides. And um, they sort of take the form of newspaper death announcements with uh, heavy mourning orders, woodcuts of coffins. But basically, it's, there were many variations all of them um, provide fairly lurid descriptions of the execution and extol the virtues of the poor uh, militiamen. It was a very harsh sentence. Jackson did have discretion in the case. Um, he did what he felt was necessary. But it definitely came back to haunt him in 1828. Here we have an inset woodcut of Jackson caning another man in the streets of Nashville. There were other incidents, including duels he had fought uh, as a younger man. All of this was dragged out into the public view in 1828. Jackson, um, yeah, basically, they, they were making the argument that he was a tyrannical military chieftain who couldn't be trusted with the power of the presidency. Jackson grimly bore these assaults on his character as just part of the rough and tumble of politics. Uh, insults to his beloved wife, Rachel, were quite a different matter. The topic of Jackson's marriage was an unusual, sen unusually sensitive topic for Jackson. Uh, when he had first met his wife, Rachel, she was actually married but separated from her first husband, Louis Robards. Uh, and evidence suggests that Andrew and Rachel lived together uh, as man and wife before the divorce from, from Robards had been legally granted. A marriage ceremony was said to have been performed in Natchez in 1791, and Jackson always insisted that that marriage was legal. Uh, even so, he and Rachel were married a second time in January of 1794. And not surprisingly, the circumstances of his marriage to Rachel uh, were dragged out into public view when he became a candidate for national office. Pro Adams pamphlets referred to Rachel as an adulteress, and Jackson never forgot or forgave those aspersions. 
And unfortunately, the intense public scrutiny of her private life um, perhaps led Rachel to dread the prospect of life in Washington because she died suddenly in late December of 1828 uh, at the Hermitage of Jackson's home near Nashville uh, at the age of 61. Jackson was devastated and delayed his journey to Washington for several weeks of, of mourning uh, after the news reached him that he had won the election. But the people had spoken and he felt he owed his duty to them. The 1828 election between Adams and Jackson fundamentally hinged on the personalities of both men rather than um, their political philosophies. And in the end, Jackson's huge popularity in the South and West couldn't be denied. He won the election in a landslide, carrying all but uh, a few New England states. And his jubilant supporters decorated their homes and places of business with souvenir objects such as this one, um, commemorating Jackson as the people's president or the hero of New Orleans. Andrew Jackson's presidency coincided with what one historian described as the first full flowering of American democracy. His, his election particularly reflected the will and aspirations of thousands of Americans intent on pushing the boundaries of their country ever farther south and west. Old Hickory was not only their champion, he was also one of them. So he was kind of at a level with George Washington as a military hero and as this quasi-deity in, in American life. But his, the sense that he was also one of the people made him much more accessible, um, more like a rock star than a god. Um, his inauguration set the tone. The doors of the White House were thrown open in the words of Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story to, quote, immense crowds of all sorts of people from the highest and most polished down to the most vulgar and gross in the nation. The political historian Alexis de Tocqueville dismissed President Jackson as, quote, a man of violent character and middling capacities, end quote, uh, an opinion no doubt colored by his association with East Coast elites who were horrified by Jackson's uh, ascendance to the presidency. On the other hand, Josiah Quincy Jr., a uh, prominent Bostonian charged with escorting President Jackson during a visit, found him to be, quote, vigorously a gentleman in his high sense of honor and in the natural straightforward courtesies. Lawyer and political satirist William Allen Butler of New York had this appraisal. His manner was then, as it always was in social intercourse, most courteous and kind. To women and children, he never was otherwise. The true Jackson, as I saw him then and afterwards, was wholly unlike the Jackson of the Whig newspapers and caricatures. Which wasn't to say that he couldn't have uh, fits of temper. He certainly did. He used his temper as a cudgel against his political enemies, uh, as a way to win arguments. Uh, he was always fully persuaded of his own uh, infallibility in many political matters. Um, but when it came to interacting with people on a personal level, he was not quite the ogre that he was often depicted as being. The popular and uncompromising former general served two turbulent terms of office as president. Uh, his firm stance against South Carolina's 1832 attempt to avoid federally mandated tariffs as well as its willingness to fight France over its failure to fulfill uh, treaty obligations uh, concerning uh, spoliation claims during the War of 1812. Um, earned him really the respect of friends and foes alike, but other policies certainly overshadowed his successes. Uh, I think someone mentioned his uh, rejection of the rechartering of the, of the United States Bank, uh, which Jackson saw as elitist and unconstitutional. Um, that led to a split among his cabinet advisors and ultimately to congressional censure for an alleged abuse of executive power. President Jackson's attempts at federal reform, including streamlining government departments and replacing key administrators, ushered in a long tradition of political patronage that unfortunately persists to this day. For most people, I think the removal of Native Americans from their ancestral lands in the southeast the reservations west of the Mississippi uh, remains Jackson's most troubling presidential legacy. Um, he did it. There's no arguing to the contrary. Um, but I should mention that the plan of doing that actually predated his administration by decades. Thomas Jefferson proposed essentially the exact same policy in 1803. It was one of Jefferson's rationales for the Louisiana Purchase. 
But Jackson carried the plan into effect, uh, and his close involvement in the removal is well documented in letters and documents of the era. And we have one of those, uh, some correspondence with his Secretary of War concerning the removal of the Cherokee from Georgia uh, on exhibition at the historic Wallace collection. But again, uh, it's not necessarily that Old Hickory hated Indians, um, as some historians have alleged, but he certainly saw their presence within the southern states as incompatible with a secure American empire. President Jackson bade farewell to the country at the conclusion of his second term in 1837 and returned to Tennessee to live out his days at the Hermitage, surrounded by family and friends. Even in retirement, the old general, he said to have preferred that term to that of president, remained a potent symbol of national politics, and his name and image were often invoked by Democrats against Whig opponents. Statesmen and foreign dignitaries journeyed to the Hermitage to pay their respects, yet Jackson's otherwise quiet retirement was troubled by financial crises and poor health. Um, he actually obtained a loan from Jean-Baptiste uh, Plochet here in Louisiana uh, after his cotton crop failed in 1842. I think the uh, amount of that was six or seven thousand dollars, which is an enormous amount of money at that time. Um, Jackson finally died at the Hermitage on June 8, 1845, and was buried two days later in the garden tomb next to his wife, Rachel. As news of his death spread, the amount of couriers riverboats and newspapers, communities around the country spontaneously organized funeral processions, eulogies, and other solemnities to mark the former president's passing. Uh, and he was still widely remembered as being the hero of New Orleans, even many years after the fact. Uh, the occasion of his death provided uh, uh, creative energy to, to new artistic interpretations of Jackson uh, on memorial ribbons, prints, and other souvenir objects. Jackson's enormous fame through much of the 19th century sustained a cottage industry among artists and craftsmen who produced souvenirs and folk art renderings for sale and home display. For some, the ubiquity of Old Hickory's likeness was too much of a good thing. In 1834, an anonymous editorialist in the Cincinnati Daily Gazette complained, quote, we have Jackson hats and Jackson coats and Jackson jackets and Jackson trousers and Jackson boots and Jackson slippers from our public squares to the country taverns, from the Hall of State to our modest homes, all is Jackson, Jackson, Jackson. <laughs> it's been said that societies create the mythic symbols that they need. Andrew Jackson was just such a figure, a man whose personal charisma, ambition, and accomplishments accorded with the wishes of thousands of Americans seeking new opportunities for themselves in the South and West. His troops nicknamed him Old Hickory on account of his toughness. Common men could identify with Jackson, the farmer, and his soldier. His restless determination to win the West set the tone for decades of American expansion and development that followed and made him a powerful symbol of American resolve and self-sufficiency. His success on the battlefield in 1850 emboldened his countrymen to imagine their fledgling republic as a future world power. So it's appropriate that New Orleans, the epicenter of Jackson's career and legend, should take a retrospective look at this American icon during the bicentennial of his famous victory. Thank you.